This evening, Rick joins us from his hometown of Edmonds, Washington, to talk about the value of travel, travel to Norway, and his background as a Norwegian American. Welcome, and thank you for being here this evening, Rick. Thank you very much, Diane. It's good to be with all of you. And it's a fun opportunity for me to think through my Norwegian heritage and the value of uh, being mindful of where you are, where your roots came from, and also to tie that in with where we are today on our place on this planet. So it's a delight to be with you. And I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions afterwards. But I think I'm going to start off by just uh, sharing with you uh, some, some slides that will uh, kind of give a little context to why I'm invited to talk uh, this evening, and also uh, uh, just to kind of work us into Norway. But like so many of you, um, my family came over on the boat from Norway. Three of my four grandparents came over. They, uh, uh, my, my mother's parents homesteaded up in Edmonton in, uh, in Alberta, and uh, my dad's Grand, grandfather, no, my dad's father came over and I went to Ellis Island and uh, actually saw on the microfiche uh, his name, Arthur Romstad and his travel buddy and where they were going and how much money they had in their pockets at the time they landed. And when they arrived in America, they had something like $10 in their pocket and they're heading to Duluth. And uh, it's amazing to me just how those courageous people, uh, you know, just ventured away from home and uh, made a better world for all of us today who are enjoying their confidence and their hard work. Uh, this is my grandparents who homesteaded in Edmonton, uh, Erna and Harold Femmerly. They hardly spoke English when they arrived. And two generations later, that little kid's family hardly speaks Norwegian. Of course, uh, so many immigrants want to embrace their adopted homeland. And that means make sure their kids, uh, you know, speak the local language. Uh, and I remember when I was uh, a very, very little kid, this is my great grandmother uh, and uh, great grandma Thorson. She would always rough up my red hair and she would say, good stock. Oh, he's got good stock. And it wasn't until about 50 years later that I realized what good stock meant back in the 1920s. I was interviewing somebody for my public radio program who wrote a book about immigration law. And back in the 20s, you were only allowed to immigrate if you had what was considered good stock. And of course, good stock uh, was a relative term. And the best stock in the estimate of the American immigration people were people who were like the norm in America, I guess. Uh, white people from, from Europe, um, better in the North, I guess. So I was the definition of good stock to a woman whose viewpoint was shaped back in the 1920s before we had a more inclusive consideration of the world. But it is quite exciting to think to me of the story of our immigrants and the story of our struggles. And uh, and how important it is to us. Um, this is a statue of Edvard Grieg in Trolldhagen. And he, that was his little shack where he would sit and compose his music surrounded by beautiful, beautiful fjord wonder. And I remember my, uh, my, I had an uncle from Norway that came over when I was just a little tyke and I was a piano player. And he said, uh, I, I played, let's see, what was the deal? I played Wedding Day at Trolldhagen for him. Uh, because my mom said, hey, uh, you know, um, Uncle Conrad wants you to hear some Norwegian music. So I played Grieg and Uncle Conrad was so thankful for this little kid to be tuned into his Norwegian heritage. He gave me $20. <laughs> I got, you know, that, uh, that was more money than I had ever owned. And it was because my uncle was thankful that I was proud and aware of my Norwegian heritage. We have this heritage and we can celebrate it. And uh, when we're fortunate enough to be able to come back and uh, actually uh, uh, go back to the old country and see it, it's just a real blessing. This is me at 14 on my first trip to Europe with my mom, somewhere in the middle of Norway, getting to know a reindeer. And uh, it's just, when I think back on those trips, I think of how blessed I was, how lucky I was that my parents prioritized in getting me to be able to understand my homeland. And uh, when I was uh, traveling uh, uh, in Norway on my very first trip, we were at Frogner Park out behind the palace in Oslo, uh, filled with work by Gustav Vigeland. 
And I distinctly remember as a little 14 year old tyke, noticing how my parents were just loving me beyond reason. Uh, they didn't have a lot of money. They were compromising hugely on their first trip to Europe by taking their little son along. And I looked out in that park, Frogner Park, and I remember it was speckled with little children just like me and their parents and their parents loving them. And it hit me. This world is home to billions of equally precious children of God. And it was a, it really kind of walloped my egocentrism to realize that I wasn't the only lovable little kid. And I learned that because I was fortunate enough to go travel. Uh, we had so much fun visiting our relatives in Norway. Uh, uh, this is my cousin, Carrie Ann, and my little cousin, Hannah, and Carrie Ann's uh, husband, uh, Eric. And um, I remember I was at uh, Hannah's place when Hannah was younger than that, 1969, on the carpet in front of the TV, watching the Apollo moon landing, watching the Apollo moon landing in Bergen. And I remember I was, I was astute enough, even as a 14 year old to realize, hey, back home, all my friends are waving American flags. But right now the whole world is celebrating the moon landing. I remember listening to the broadcast in Norwegian and leap to skritte for men or whatever the Norwegian is and a giant leap for mankind. <laughs> and I was so thankful to have those little Eurekas because I was able to go back to the old country. We learned about our heritage. We learned about the importance of our heritage, and we also learned how big and diverse this world is. I remember on those early trips, I was traveling in Scandinavia. On this trip, I would imagine. Uh, this looks like the trip after I graduated from high school. And um, I remember thinking when I was in Denmark and Sweden, yeah, these are my people. I'm here in Scandinavia. These are all my you know, ethnic brothers and sisters. And then I crossed the border from Sweden into Norway. And it was, oh my goodness, no, these are my people. There's something so powerful about our roots. It's hard to put my finger on it, but boy, to go to the old country was just, just an amazing thing to me. I was so thankful to be able to go there. And of course, if you're slumming around Europe with your buddy uh, the, the, the month after you graduate from high school and don't have any money, you've always got friendly Norwegians <laughs> to drop in on. And I would just routinely sleep on the train all the way up to, to Norway in order to, to have family. And uh, anywhere someone who's traveling has relatives, it's worth looking them up. In fact, I remember thinking if you don't have relatives, it's worth getting out a phone book and making up a name because there's nothing like having friends in the old country when you're on the road, interested in a little home cook uh, break from the struggle of being a vagabond on the road. Hey, let me just show you, I'd just like to share a few slides about Norway, just a few, but I just love gaining an appreciation of the, of, of the traditional culture and how it's connecting with its own nature. And all over the world, of course, traditional people connect with their nature. I don't know if I can think of any country that connects more intimately with its nature than in Norway. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, the cultural center of Norway, I, I believe, is Bergen as much as Oslo. Way out there, far from Sweden, far from Denmark, close to the nature and celebrating the, the natural wonder all around them. And before I go anywhere in a country, I like to go to the big museum. In the, in the capital, in the case of Os uh, Norway, of course, it'd be the National Museum in Oslo, and see how romantic artists in the 19th century portrayed the old homeland, like this painting here. And then you go out into the countryside and you appreciate that wonder. I appreciate the fact that so many Norwegians settled where I, my parents ended up, in Seattle, in Washington State, uh, in the Northwest. And uh, I spent my youth before starting to go to Europe hanging out in the San Juan Islands and a lot of Scandinavians up there, a lot of beautiful boats, a lot of fjord country. It's no wonder that uh, there's little uh, Ricky and his sister Jan on a raft. We are just little Norwegians whose parents decided to settle down in the part of the United States that probably looks more like Norway than any other place, uh, Puget Sound and the San Juan Islands. Uh, what's Seattle's sister city? Well, it would be Bergen, ha, for good reason. Bergen and Seattle, they just feel like, like kin. And uh, I just love, love traveling in Bergen. I love exploring Norway. And I love the Viking heritage, uh, the, 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 the adventure 
to get on that boat and see what's out there beyond the horizon. And of course, that was a thousand years ago with the Vikings, but it was just a, a generation ago with Tor Heyerdahl, uh, with the Kantiki and the Ra. So, and, and of course, the great Arctic explorers a hundred years ago. So much adventure spirit. And when I think about my love of travel, I think a big part of that is I'm thankful for my Norwegian heritage. When I go to Norway, I just love delving into that heritage, finding not just a Viking ship in a museum, but going out into the woods and finding a thousand year old Viking ceremonial burial ground with stones the shape of a Viking ship. And that's where you, where you try to imagine a thousand years ago faces torchlit gathering together as they bid goodbye to a loved one, or they do whatever they can figure out to do to get closer to God. Wow, to understand the deep roots of your heritage and how that impacts us to this day, I think is really, really exciting. And the Scandinavian countries were innovators in, in open air folk museums. The very first open air folk museums were in Scandinavia, Oslo and Stockholm debate, which one was first? Of course, you got the wonderful Open Air Folk Museum in, in Oslo over at Big Doy, and you got the beautiful one at Skansen in Stockholm. And I've uh, sort of gotten into that struggle. And, and one of them was an Open Air Folk Museum, but not open to the public. It was just a royal thing. And the other was absolutely open to the public. And uh, so you can debate which one was actually first, but they're both great. And these are culture on a lazy Susan for us travelers that want to better understand our homeland wherever you're going. Go to the National, go to the Open Air Folk Museum. Generally, in or near the capital city. Uh, there's a great one in Copenhagen. There's a great one in Stockholm. There's a great one in Oslo. There's a great one in Helsinki. There's a great one in Tallinn. Wherever you travel, check out the Open Air Folk Museum. And at the entryway, look at the what's going on today list because you want to be at the right place at the right time to enjoy not just empty buildings, but culture in action. And in Oslo and up in um, um, Mayhaugen, uh, near Lillehammer, they have just wonderful culture, dancing and music and, and arts and crafts and cooking. And uh, you can spend a whole day in these open air folk museums very easily. Then when you venture out into the countryside and you actually go to the sites uh, from where a lot of these historic buildings came, uh, it makes more sense to you. So before you leave the capital city, go to the National Museum and be inspired by the romantic art of the late 1900s. And then go to the Open Air Folk Museum so you can learn about this and then venture out into the countryside. Of course, in Norway, there's a well-trodden path, the, the Norway in a nutshell trip from Oslo out to the fjords. And it's touristy, it's obvious, it's a slam dunk. And if you just have 24 or 48 hours from Oslo, it's your most sightseeing thrills per minute. I just love this opportunity to get close to nature and for me to be on a ferry on the fjords on a sunny day. Wow, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. A great thing about traveling in Norway is you're visiting a sparsely populated, well-organized, affluent country that just really knows how to get things done. I mean, the, the way the transportation is all coordinated is just exciting, especially when you've just come from countries further south. But, you know, here in Flam, three or four trains arrive a day and three or four boats take off a day, coordinated just beautifully with each other. I've had so much fun over the years taking my tour groups around Scandinavia. And one of my favorite things, this is one of our buses here, is just exploring the fjords by bus. And uh, this is a point where I just stopped the bus and I let everybody get out and hike down the switchbacks so they can actually feel the wind and, and be surrounded by the nature instead of looking out the window. There are so many opportunities to celebrate the nature, the culture, the heritage, the history, and the modern struggles of these countries, and to see how they organize their communities today. That's one thing I really love about Norway and Scandinavia in general, is how they are so um, progressive, so honest, so sustainable, so creative, so compassionate in their societies. And uh, I think we can learn a lot from them. Of course, Oslo is the, the sightseeing capital as well as the political capital of Norway. And here you got the old fortress of Oslo and uh, the city hall. One thing I love about the city hall is the murals inside that really celebrate Norwegian culture and the story of the Norwegians. And for me, one of the highlights of my any of my travels in Europe has been when my uncle took me on a walk through the city hall in Oslo and we found the, the mural uh, the long mural that just tells a story 
of the Nazi occupation when the Nazis came and then five years later or whatever, when they were finally kicked out and Norway was free again and, and the valor of the Norwegians. You can follow that up with a visit to the uh, Nazi resistance museum in Akershus castle right there on the little bluff overlooking the harbor. But to see this patriotic, spirited, beautiful art that just wallpapers the uh, city hall in Oslo is one of the great experiences, uh, I think, in Europe because it is so poignant. It is so today as well as yesterday, all rolled in together. And here we have the, the motto of Oslo, um, united and eternal. And I'm sure that was a motto that had a particular ring to it when Norwegians finally won back their freedom after the horrors of World War II. Uh, of course, uh, Oslo has a wonderful ski jump, and uh, I've never been there in the winter during a festival, but you can certainly go there in the summer, and that's just one of endless attractions, and a fun way to experience it all is to stay in people's homes in a husram, and that's where you get to connect more intimately with the culture. Uh, this is just a fun sign that reminds me, when you're in Scandinavia, uh, most people speak English, and even if they don't, you can look at the language and kind of figure it out. Too many people just don't make educated guesses. Here we are not feeling very well. You got a sign with a red cross on it, and it points to Central Sick House. Hey, you can go down there and get fixed up. It's impressive to me how many people would bleed to death looking for the word hospital. They've got different words, but our languages are related. We can make an educated guess, or we can find any, just about anybody in Norway, frankly, who will speak some English for us. Okay, that's just a quick look at Norway and my Norwegian heritage. I'd love to take about a half an hour and just share with you how my travels have given me a global perspective that I really value. Why I think travel is an important act. Uh, and uh, ever since I was a kid, I've been running around the world. I've spent 100 days a year ever since I graduated from high school. Uh, that was a long time ago in Europe. I'm not on vacation. I'm working on my guidebooks, working on my TV shows, working on my tour program. And to this day, I'm still doing exactly what I've been doing ever since I was a kid. I've just got technology beyond my wildest dreams. And I've got 100 wonderful colleagues, uh, travel enthusiasts just like me. And together we are producing content designed to help people travel smartly and meaningfully. And then we are amplifying it to the best of our ability uh, through guidebooks, through TV, through radio, through our web and on and on. So um, for me, sort of fundamental to good travel is being open to new dimensions of culture. I've got my yay toast right here on my table and um, uh, Norway has got some beautiful cheese. I love goat cheese. Um, and anywhere you go in Europe, you'll find local edible traditions. Here we are in France. And in France, of course, the cheese shop is a festival of mold. Uh, you step in there and you meet the cheesemonger who is uh, sort of evangelical about their cheese. He'll take you over to the moldy goat cheese corner, pulls up a wad of goat cheese, takes a deep whiff. Oh, I'm sure this smells like the feet of angels. You know, for me, Cheese was no big deal before I started traveling. It was just orange in the shape of the bread, your cheese sandwich. But when you travel, you realize different people get excited about different things. I love that. And you don't need to go home and buy expensive, stinky cheese, but you do have that option. And for the rest of your life, you'll know that there are a lot of people that do. A great thing about travel is the people you meet. I think one of my favorite countries is Ireland, because in Ireland, I have the sensation that I'm understanding a foreign language. <laughs> I just, I wish I understood a foreign language, but I don't. But in Ireland, people have that wonderful lilt, that wonderful gift of gab. They just love to talk. It's an art of conversation. And if you've got a busy sightseeing schedule and you meet these guys and they want to talk, forget your schedule. This is what you came to Ireland for. This is what you travel for, to talk to the people. People, carbonate the experience. I was talking to the guy in the right there. And after a while, I said, uh, I asked him, uh, were you born here? He said, no, it was about five miles down the road. Later on, I asked him, have you lived here all your life? He said, not yet. Uh, man, it's the people. People, you know, if I'm doing a tour, writing a guidebook, making a TV show, if I'm not helping my travelers connect with people, I'm not doing my job. I want to have a local voice in my TV show. I want to connect with the people in my travels. That's the mark of a good traveler. If you're exploring some town on the Italian Riviera and you meet a monk, get talking to him. He'll invite you into the Abbey and pour you some of his 
is homemade limoncello. Anybody can do this. You don't need to be some TV host or some travel writer to do this. You can meet the locals. One thing I'm really passionate about in my travels, if I'm trying to think of what makes a good traveler, become a cultural chameleon. I physically change when I'm traveling. When I'm in Belgium, I'm excited about chocolate. I'm not excited about chocolate at other places. I'm certainly not excited about it in this hemisphere. But when I'm in Belgium, I get into it. And I go to the little chocolate teria and I go to a woman whose family has been making this chocolate for generations. I learn about it and I enjoy it. When I'm in the Czech Republic, I don't have wine, I have beer. When I'm in Tuscany, I don't have beer, I have wine. When I'm in Oslo or Norway, I have Octavit. I, I have I have herring at breakfast. I don't have herring at breakfast here. You want to be a temporary local. It makes all the difference in the world. Of course, you spend less money, but more importantly, you make more friends. You broaden your perspective. You learn. I'm, as a tour guide, I'm pretty adamant about this. One of my I just I just introduce people to things. I mean, goat cheese. It's kind of gross. Ecta ye toast, man. Oh man, it looks like earwax, you know, but but spread that on your bread and you've got yourself quite a treat. Well, it takes a little salesmanship for a tour guide to get their group to enjoy that, that yay toast, just like it takes a little salesmanship for a tour guide to get everybody in France to have an escargot. But when I crossed the border from France to, uh, from Switzerland to France, with my tour groups, first thing we do that first night, I don't make everybody eat a dozen escargot, but I buy two dozen escargot. Everybody eats one. You don't have to like it, but everybody's got to try one fascinating to me. Half of the people said they wouldn't like it. And they don't like it. Half of the people said they wouldn't like it and they do like it. You don't know until you try it. That's a beautiful thing about travel. You know, we love our liberty, our liberty here in the United States, but in Europe, they've got a lot of liberty too. Here's a place that's got double the liberty they think that we got. And all over Europe, you can enjoy people celebrating their liberty, their culture, their heritage. It's a beautiful thing about getting into your heritage. Of course, every country has got an equally uh, passionate sort of interest in their own heritage. And that's one, one of the rationales for studying our own heritage. Here in this little town in Italy, every summer they have a festival where the older kids teach the younger kids how to make a good ravioli. Why? It's a calculated way to help the, the, the krumkaka of every culture be passed from one generation down to the next. I remember the day my grandmother gave me the krumkaka iron. Whoa, this was a big deal because she wanted that slice of Norwegian culture to survive. It's the same in every culture. Here in this little town in the French uh, uh, Burgundy region, so famous for its wine, the Chamber of Commerce has pooled its humble resources and made these orbs, these glass orbs, where a visitor can actually smell, appreciate the bouquet of the different wines that are produced on that valley. It's a beautiful thing. Here in this town in Southern Italy, you go to the market and people happily pay too much for their bread in order to buy it from the person who bakes it. It's just a sort of family lifestyles. It's a community spirit. And we have that wherever we travel. Ooh, in Italy, they sure love their fine wine. And they also know where to fill it up really cheap. This is a filling station, a literal filling station for table wine. All over Europe, you have people with their lifestyle embracing it. And when we travel, we can learn about that. I find it so exciting to broaden our perspectives through travel. And also we learn how people look at us. You learn a lot more about your home sometimes by leaving it and looking at it from afar and talking to people who have looked at us from afar and assessed us. I think a lot of Americans underappreciate how Europe is thankful for our strength and our commitment to democracy and how Europeans look to America for leadership and how disillusioned and discouraged Europeans are when we do not show leadership. When America pulls away from the world and when America wants to build walls, it breaks the hearts of other people who look to America for leadership. You know, our American ideals are much bigger and brighter and more resilient than any particular politician's policies or any particular trend of the day politically. The ideals of America shine brightly on a hill and inspire the world. And we need to remember that. We have a, I think we have an obligation to the world to be a leader, to set an example, to care about democracy, to care about other people's democracy to fight for freedom. 
I was at a castle in France a few years ago and we were busy filming and the sun was going down and I needed to get up on the rooftop. And I came in and I said, hi, I'm Rick. We've got an appointment. And they go, oh, we have an American film crew. And I say, is there any way we can get up under the roof because the sun's going down? I got it. No, we must have a party. We will never let an American uh, group come into our castle without a little party. I said, okay. So they pull out the wine, they pull out the cheese and the crackers. And then as if bringing out a religious relic, they came to us with their American flag, the 48 star American flag that they hoisted over their village on that day in 1945, when they were liberated from Nazi tyranny by American soldiers. And they told us we'll never let an American group, an American traveler into our castle without bringing out our flag and saying, thank you. And we'd love it if you would go home and share with your neighbors how we in France really appreciate America's leadership. Of course, we can have sibling squabbles and so on, but Europeans are thankful for our leadership. Europeans look to us for leadership and Europeans expect a lot from us. And I think we're big enough and good enough and smart enough to recognize that that's an important thing. Europe has suffered from a lot of wars, terrible wars, twice in the last century. Can you imagine after the rubble of World War II, Europeans sitting in the rubble of a bombed out continent thinking, we got to do something. And they decided to weave their economies together by creating a union, the European Union. And it's a complicated thing. It's hard to talk proud sovereign nations out of their own sovereignty, but without giving up sovereignty, you've got no union. And it's been a stuttering evolution since the late 1940s until today to create this European Union. And today, the European Union is here to stay. And you can laugh about their over-the-top bureaucracies and their inefficiencies. And you can wonder how what's going to happen after Brexit. But the core of Europe is together. And when you look at the at the museums that that commemorate the hundredth anniversary of World War II and, the, and 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 the great battles of World War or the hundredth anniversary of World One and the great battles of World War II, you see the French and the Germans flag side by side. There's no bad guys. There's just countries that were led astray by bombastic leaders and misguided policies. And today in Europe, they know that there can be no winner in a war. There can be no winner in a war. And thank God, with the European Union, the economies of France and Germany are woven together and there will never again be a big war in Europe. Apart from anything else where the European Union could be disappointing, in the European estimate, the reason for that union is to weave the economies of Germany and France together so they won't go to war together, it's just inconceivable, and to create a big free trade zone to compete with other big free trade zones like the United States, in emerging economies, the Pacific Rim, China, Pacific Rim. Uh, you know, Europe has about the same GDP as we do. And um, now they're a big free trade zone like us and they can compete with us. Europeans, we can learn a lot from them. They work hard and they play hard. And I've learned from my Norwegian friends that there's more than one work ethic. You know, my parents raised me thinking the work ethic, but it's not the work ethic, it's a work ethic. Here are some uh, guys in, uh, and gals in in Amsterdam. And it's a Wednesday afternoon, I'm wandering around Amsterdam doing my research for my guidebook and I see grown adults having a party in a boat. I wonder, maybe I'm missing a festival or something. I ask them, what's going on? And they say, it's Wednesday afternoon. We cut out from work early and we have a party every Wednesday. You wanna get in the boat? (laughs) No, I gotta work. Well, it's just annoying, but Europeans work less than we do and they make less than we do by choice. But by every estimate, they make as much per hour as we do, and they just choose to work fewer hours. When you travel, you realize that every country has its 4th of July, its September May. In Switzerland here, it's the 1st of August. It's exciting to celebrate each culture's big festivals. It's important to remember that Americans have the American dream. Norwegians don't have the American dream. They got the Norwegian dream. These friends in Sri Lanka have the Sri Lankan dream. My Bulgarian friends have the Bulgarian dream. That's a beautiful thing. And all over the world, when you travel, you have that same Eureka I had at Frogner Park. And you recognize the power, the power of the love of a parent and that parent's child. It's a beautiful thing. And you're reminded that that child is just as precious as yours or mine. You learn when you travel that there are different struggles going on. Struggles were 
oblivious to. I mean, I was in Turkey, tooling around in the east of Turkey in the shadow of Mount Ararat with a tour group once, and you don't have a list of famous sites. When you're doing that, you've just got um, <laughs> you've just got a, a sort of a cultural scavenger hunt agenda, and you're looking for something to to check out. We found a high school stadium filled with high school kids having a pep rally. We stopped the bus, go in. What's happening? A hundred kids thrusting their fist up in the air at the same time, singing, "We are a secular nation." We are a secular nation. I asked my guide, what's going on? Don't they like God here in Turkey? She goes, oh, no, we love God. But considering the rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism just over the border, we're very concerned about the fragile and precious separation of mosque and state here in Turkey. And we're having a pep rally for, for pluralism. A pep rally for pluralism. Separation of mosque and state. I never even considered that. And I wouldn't have considered it had I not had the opportunity to travel and to travel in a way that gets me out of my comfort zone and teaches me something. Eastern Turkey is clearly out of my comfort zone. A lot of people do what they can to avoid culture shock. To me, culture shock is why I travel. Culture shock, it's the growing pains of a broadening perspective. It's a beautiful thing. And we enjoy that when we travel. We meet people who are different than us. We meet people that our government says should be our enemies. And we realize they're not our enemies. They're just people struggling. Every time I go someplace I'm not supposed to go, whether it's Afghanistan or Iran or Palestine or Russia, I am blown away by the people I meet. And I leave that country knowing that my visit has been helpful for peace because it's tougher for them to demonize Americans now that they've met one. And it's tougher when I come home from our government's propaganda to demonize them in my eyes. If we all could travel before we could vote, this world would be a much better place. I learned that when I went to Iran. A few years ago, I went to Iran. It was very exciting to go to Iran because I wanted to humanize 70 million Persians. What would make them vote for the people they vote for? My friends asked me, why are you going to Iran? There's supposed to be terrible people over there. And uh, I said, well, you know, I guess I said it's good style to know people before you bomb them because we were about to bomb Iran and we still couldn't do that, you know, depending on our policies. And I thought, I'm a taxpayer. And uh, as an honest taxpayer, I know that every bomb that falls and every bullet that flies has my name on it. And sometimes we have to use them, but I want to take a little responsibility for it. I know, I want to know what's going on and you don't know what's going on unless you go over there yourself and you meet the people. So I went to Iran and thankful to, for public television, I had an avenue to share what I learned. Oh, baby. I, we, we did a one hour show on Iran. You can watch anytime if you like. It's, it's on my, all my shows are on my website, by the way, you can stream them for free with no ads. Uh, but you know, we're in Tehran here. It's 10 million people, eight story tall graffiti, hateful down with the USA. Look at that flag. Stripes are falling bombs. And the stars are skulls. Whoa. Walking below that graffiti, awkward. But I reminded myself, everybody I'm meeting was not even born when that was painted. And they live in a country that's not free. They've got a theocracy. They can't raise their voices. So I wanted to meet the people. Big city, lots of traffic, lots of traffic jam. Stuck in a traffic jam on the very street down there later on that day. It's just quiet. Suddenly the man in the next car went like this to my driver, roll down your window. He handed over a bouquet of flowers. And he told my driver to give it to the foreigner in your back seat and apologize for your traffic. Ha! I don't know about Iowa, but in Seattle where I live, that never happens. Later on, I was in another traffic jam. And right, and we were just, it was just stopped. We couldn't go anywhere and it was just silent. And then suddenly my driver just blurted out, death to traffic. And I said, wait a minute. I thought it was death to Israel or death to America. And he said, no, right now it's death to traffic. I said, what's with that, with you Iranians, always saying death to everything? And, you know, he tried to explain it to me. In his broken English, he said, well, when something is out of our control and frustrating to us, we say death to that. And I thought, hmm. He is describing the word damn. When something's out of our control and frustrating, we say damn. Damn the weather. Damn election fraud. Damn the traffic. And I thought, wow, had I not traveled here, I wouldn't have known what death to meant. It's people who don't speak English trying to say, damn, death to. 
I thought, have I ever thought death, uh, death too? Have I ever thought like, you know, damn those teenagers? Huh. Yeah, I have. Now, do I really want them to die and burn in hell for an eternity? As I just said, literally, no, of course not. It's just after midnight, turn down the music, damn those teenagers. But the world is complicated. Everybody's got different baggage. We've got 9-11 baggage, you know. Uh, I'm sure Norwegians have their baggage. Iranians have their baggage. And we got to give everybody a little wiggle room and it's nice to meet each other and talk to each other. We can go to Iran. We can understand what it's like to be living there. We can understand what is their baggage, which is, by the way, the Iran-Iraq war, where they had a hundred, what did they have? They had a, they had a million casualties in the Iran-Iraq war. And uh, when they were invaded by Saddam Hussein, and uh, today you see the baggage, you see the impact of that on, their, on the people. Here's a widow who lost her husband or, husband or son in that war in 1980s. And every Friday since, she's come to that tomb, sat in that tomb and wept. And I don't know what she's thinking, but she's got baggage. And maybe it involves the United States. And we need to appreciate that. On the last day in Iran, oh, I just had such a powerful trip. A woman came over to me and did this little thing where she pointed on my, pounded her forefinger on my chest and said, are you an American? I said, yes. She said, I want you to go home and tell the truth. We're united. And we're strong and we just don't want our little girls raised like Britney Spears. I thought, well, neither do we. This is interesting. And I just uh, realized what motivates the Iranians to elect the government that they've got. They're so afraid of regime change, of some other culture coming in and changing them. And they are afraid that their little girls will become boy toys, drug addicts, and crass materialists. Hey. It's good people, good people motivated by fear and love. Who voted for those politicians in Iran? Because they did vote. And they are the small town, less educated fundamentalists. Again, good people motivated by love and riddled with fear. And they just don't want to lose their values. As we travel, we gain an appreciation for that. And we come home with the most beautiful perspective. And that is a broader, broader global viewpoint. And we look at these little girls and we don't think, why are they wearing those dark hoods? We look at their faces and their bright eyes and we wish the best for them. I can see my daughter in that school group. I've had so many opportunities in my travels and uh, from Norway and from Finland all the way to Ethiopia and Egypt, I've been able to test thoughts. I've been able to learn. I've been able to get out of my comfort zone. I just produced a show called uh, Hunger and Hope, Lessons Learned in Ethiopia and Guatemala. And the mission there was to try to better understand modern aid and why it's not just love your neighbor, but it's a good investment for stability. And as we traveled, we realized 10% of humanity is living in abject poverty, extreme poverty, on $2 a day or less. Half of humanity is trying to live on $5 a day. That's tough, but that's, that's, that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the inexcusable, considering how much wealth we have on our planet, fact that 10% of humanity is trying to live in extreme poverty. No running water, no access to medical care, no education, stunted children, children who didn't get the proper nutrition in their first thousand days, so they grew up underperforming. And how smart aid, not yesterday's aid, which made people dependent and was filled with corruption, but today's aid, smart aid, practical aid, empowers societies struggling in the developing world, not making them dependent, but making them independent. I got to talk to people when we made this show. I got to learn that the average lot of life for women, lot in life for women on this planet, the average woman on this planet spends several hours a day abandoning her family to walk for firewood and to walk for water. I would imagine this woman is nowhere near as old as she looks. And her lot in life is that because of structural poverty. I got to see what it's like to live off the grid with no running water when you walk all day long to get water for your family. I got to see, look into the eyes of extreme poverty. And I got to also see what happens when a community is given a chance with smart, 
development aid. And that is thanks to American taxpayers by and large. We can make a huge difference. And when I meet people who have had that benefit, who have a little electricity, who have a spigot with water, who have a concrete floor and a metal roof, who have education, who have children who have education. Oh man, it makes me so happy. And I'm, I'm blessed to have this exposure and to have this appreciation because I've traveled. And that's why for me, my mission is to inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando, to inspire Americans to get out there and, and come home with that most beautiful souvenir. Uh, an outlook where you're more inclined to build bridges and less inclined to build walls. Because you can see what happens when people get together. You can see the beautiful humanity of mothers with little kids. And you can see the value of them getting an education and knowing how to raise their kids so they're educated with bright eyes in the future. Oh, I could talk all day about that, but I do have a, a one hour TV show called Hunger and Hope. And uh, you can watch any of my shows. I've got 150 shows that you can watch uh, anytime you want on my website at ricksteves.com. But here we have uh, a shot of me when I was a kid, not knowing the value of this, but traveling with my window down and learning whether I liked it or not. And then much later in life, I travel in a way where I'm exposed to realities, where I believe, I learn that even if you're motivated only by greed, if you know what's good for you, you don't want to be filthy rich in a desperately poor world. Not a nice place to raise your kids. Here in this middle-class neighborhood in Nicaragua or El Salvador, the community pools its resources so they can have an armed guard so the kids can get to the park safely and back. Every hotel, every pharmacy, every bank has an armed guard. We don't want to go there, but we are going there if we have a society with a huge gap between rich and poor. You learn so much when you leave your country and you look at it from a distance. And even if we are affluent enough to barricade ourselves behind designer fortifications as a family, as a community, or as a country, it's not a pretty picture. It's not something that we want as our future because these little kids, ah, they're so beautiful. They're so precious, just like our own, just like our own. And for the, for the cost of almost Nothing in our society for the cost of one set of braces on one of our kids. You could drill a well in a community that's thirsty where all the moms have to abandon their kids every day and walk for water. And then every morning when those moms walk across the street instead of walking across the county to pump their water, what are they going to think? God bless America. That's called soft power. That's what we need right now. And we learn that when we travel. Let me just close, because you can just tell I'm kind of excited about the value of travel. I'm a tour guide. I get, a, get Americans out of their comfort zone and expose them to things that are kind of freaky and kind of scary. Hey, a whirling dervish, what's that? Well, it's entertainment on a cruise ship for most people, but it's actually a monk with something to say. As a tour guide with a group of Americans in Turkey, I'll never forget my opportunities to introduce them to a dervish. Let me just explain to you the, uh, the uh, the, the the situation. In fact, um, I'm gonna just uh, uh, yeah. There's there's my dear great grandma who knew that I had good stock, but the good stock that she was talking about now has me blessed and privileged enough to get out there and to explore the world, to explore my heritage, to use that as a springboard to explore other people's heritage. And when I think about that dervish, I just love this dervish. I'm a Lutheran because I'm a Norwegian. I mean, that's kind of it. My, my grandparents came over, they're Lutherans. My parents are Lutherans. They raised me to be a Lutheran. I'm a Lutheran. That's what I belong to be. I wanna be a Lutheran. I like being a Lutheran. But I also love to learn from other people who are working very hard, hard to get close to God, to love their creator. And uh, that dervish, I met him. I said, I'm a tour guide. I've got 20 Americans. Love to meet you and see what you do. He said, I'm not a photo op, but I'll let you observe me if I can explain to you what I do. Okay, I say. I'm just paraphrasing here. So we met him. He's all dressed up like his monk outfit and said, he says, Merhaba, I'm a dervish. You Christians would probably call me a monk. And he said, I follow Mevlana. I think you call him Rumi. Uh, he's kind of like the St. Francis of, for Muslims, the prophet of love. Everybody can get their brains around that. And he said, five times a day, I whirl myself into meditative trance. 
I put one step in the middle, one foot in the middle. And if I was with you on a stage today, I'd demonstrate it. I'll just let you use your imagination. Put one foot in the middle, my family, my community, Iowa. And the other foot goes around the world, celebrating the diversity in God's great creation. And I put one hand up to accept the love of our creator. And the other hand goes down like the spout on a tea kettle and showers God's love on my community, on my family, on my loved ones, and on the rest of creation. And five times a day, I whirl into a meditative trance. And I, be, I, I, I meditate on how I can be a conduit of God's love. And I watched him as he whirled himself, his head tilted over, his robe billowed out. He lost himself in that beautiful thinking. And then I looked over at my travelers and I saw the wonder sweeping over their faces. And I thought, this is what travel's all about. This is what travel's all about. And that's why I spend a lot of my energy and a lot of my time cheerily trying to equip and inspire people to get out of their comfort zones, go to the old country, learn about it, and use it as a springboard to get comfortable with this beautiful world of ours. Hey, let me just finish with uh, just three minutes from a show that I produced. It's the only show I produced during COVID. And then we'll have questions. And uh, I'd love to talk to your questions. Put them down in the question section if you like. But this is a show I produced, um, which is kind of a love note to travel. And after this, it's why we travel. And um, at the, this is just the last three minutes of it. And it's called, uh, this part is connecting. And, and I wanted to find some sort of a summation. Where was it all going? We travel to connect. We explore our heritage to connect. And we then travel around to realize how, how much we all have in common. By traveling thoughtfully, we connect. Even for those of us who can only travel as a state of mind, travel can result in a deeper connection. Travel connects us face to face with reality. It's not virtual. It's not through a viewfinder. Travel is candid, honest, being in the moment. Thank you. In a world hungry for authenticity, we yearn for connection. But now she's quite big. She's like you, about like that, yeah. Travelers connect with different cultures, different people. On the road, Strangers are just friends we've yet to meet. Travel frees us from routine. It creates room for serendipity. Okay, so now I'm ready to be a shepherd. This is serendipity leads to connections. Travel forces us to bend and to flex. It makes us more tolerant and inspires us to celebrate diversity. The lessons I've gained from exploring Europe the land of my heritage, are universal. For me, these lessons are affirmed and then stretched when traveling further afield. As a child ventures beyond his backyard, I ventured beyond Europe. Year after year, I pushed my boundaries. The world opened wide with a montage of wonders and lessons learned. Traveling beyond my comfort zone Culture shock became constructive. The growing pains of a broadening perspective. My ethnocentrism challenged. The celebration of difference and oneness at the same time. The recognition that love is love in their home just as in mine. I think this is a beautiful, so. beautiful welcome here. Through travel, we see a world filled with joy, with compassion, and with good people. We learn the more we reach out, the more we receive. We learn that we all share the same world. Nice. And we all share the same window of time. Travelers seek bridges rather than walls. Every wall has two sides and two narratives. For one to be truly understood, both must be heard. Traveling, we realize the challenges of our future will be blind to borders and best overcome not by conflict and walls, but by community and bridges. There's so much fear these days. The flip side of fear? It's understanding. And we gain understanding when we travel. What is this? 
celebration of Obama's Travel is more than a holiday. It gives us new experiences, acts as our greatest teacher, makes our lives more meaningful, and connects us with a global family. We can't all travel physically, but anyone can live with a traveler's mindset. It's a choice. Travel makes us more comfortable with the world, our hearts bigger, and our lives richer. And it makes us happier. And that is why we travel. And that is all I've got to say right now. Let's have some questions. Wonderful, Rick. Thank you so much. I'm Loran Gilbertson, Vesterheim's Chief Curator. Let's start out, Rick. Travel for the purpose of challenging cultural assumptions is an innovative approach to travel and a travel business. In what other ways has your approach to putting together travel experiences been different from what others have done before or are doing now? You know, I've been at this, uh, I wrote my first book in 1980, Loran, uh, that's 40 years now. And um, there's been a radical change in what motivates travelers. And it's shaped by our sort of fast paced media world. Um, long form is, is bad news if you wanna make money. You need clicks, you need it to be fast. Uh, people have a short attention span. A lot of times in public television, I brag that we are programming that uh, assumes an attention span and respects your intellect. Other people, it's clickbait. And that's what people want is that entertainment. So today, um, of course, there's good travel writers, but most people make their money as bloggers and they're paid by how many clicks they get. And, and you know, if you certain things are going to lead and they're going to get a lot more clicks than other stuff. Um, also, um, this long form, short form thing is a big challenge for anybody who's producing content. Uh, in my public radio show, I have a weekly hour that airs all over the country in 400 stations. And um, it's not me teaching, it's me being that conduit, talking to interesting people about travel. But each one of our shows is kind of unusual these days in radio because it's three interviews, a 12 minute, 18 and 18 for the hour. And I keep, I'm always told by people who are consultants to help radio shows be more popular. You need a whole series of six minute interviews. See, that would be much more popular. So as a travel teacher, I'm lucky because everything's worked out for me where I can write my own rules a little bit, but we need to delve deeper into things. And um, I guess part of my luck, my, what I'm lucky about is I'm not publicly held. So a board of directors defending the, financial needs of the stockholders can't tell me, Rick, you'll make more money if you do it this way. And sort of in a weird hippie kind of way, I measure my profit on how many people's perspectives I can broaden through my work. Consequently, for the last two years, I've, I've had 100 people on my payroll and no revenue because the main way we make money is our tours and we've not been able to do any tours. But my profit as the CEO of this business is to broaden perspectives. And for me, that's profit. If I can talk to, you know, we got 600 households watching right now. If I can talk to 600 people and um, challenge them with a few of these ideas I've picked up, that's just pure profit, you see, because that makes my work worthwhile. So I'm lucky because I get to teach and I get very rewarded by that. And it never gets old. I'm just really thankful for my niche and thankful to talk to a, a group like we have together today. Tell us a little bit about how things have gone during the pandemic for you and your business. Well, the, from a business point of view, it's it's been horrible because we came off of our best year ever in 2019. We took 30,000 people on 1,200 different tours around Europe, and uh, we were just euphoric. I had 100 of my guides from all over Europe packing into my living room right here two weeks before the pandemic hit. Uh, that, that senior center 10 miles away in Kirkland here is where the first cases were. And we were just having this, we were just euphoric. Everybody was dancing and partying and celebrating our work. And they all flew back to Europe and we were ready for the best year ever. And then everything shut it down. And now my staff here has been, uh, I've been able to keep them on the payroll, but it's been tough. And my guides in Europe are freelancers. They're just waiting around for work, you know? So it's very tough. Uh, we, we keep hoping, but the pandemic is kind of feisty and a lot of people don't want to get their vaccinations and it just, it's going to drag on and on longer than it needs to. So we're, we're, we're persevering. Uh, but I think we're going to get into a point where we're just going to 
live with this and start traveling and 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 go through the little headaches you got to go through to travel. I've had two trips in the last three, three or four months, and I've had a great time. Uh, you know, and you just you got to get your shot and you got to do your red tape stuff. But it's gonna we're gonna we're on a trajectory to normalcy, but we got to get through Omicron. And um, you know, we've 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 got a lot of work to do yet. Uh, but I fully expect we've got our tours sold out for this coming year. Basically, we got we're ninety percent sold out, so we have most of those 30,000 people back on board. All of us are hoping and praying we can do our traveling and we got to just take a month at a time. Well, assuming we'll all be traveling very, very soon, uh, we often look to your guidebooks for help on our travels. You often are preparing solo travelers, but you can often offer some assistance for thus, those of us who do group travel of how to customize or personalize a group travel experience. Can you give us a few suggestions? Uh, well, that's our main thing is, I mean, my, my passion is independent travel. You know, I write these guidebooks. I've got 50 different guidebooks and this is designed so people can do my tours without me. I used to do a tour called Scandinavian 22 days and the handbook was called Scandinavian 22 days. And people would, I'd have it laying around in my lectures and I'd, people would, I'd hope people would thumb through that and take the tour, but they were thumbing through that and going, Oh, I like this. And they took the, the handbook. And I thought this book is driving decent people to theft. I better make it available for purchase. So I did. And honestly, the whole idea is to put everything I know about the tour in here so people can do the tour without me. And that seems to work very well. So I've got that independent approach to tourism in here. And a big part of that is encouraging people to be capable. We organize together and then we disperse. Um, Instead of keeping in the dark, people in the dark in order to sell them things as you go along. Sadly, the typical tour company gets you on with an impossible price and they don't even make enough money to pay their tour guides other than a token wage. And then they make money off you over their course of your vacation by selling you optional sightseeing and taking you shopping for kickbacks. And that just puts the guide at odds with the paying customers. And I think most of uh, um, more sophisticated consumers would rather, rather pay the whole price up front and have the tour company honestly on their side. But apart from that, um, I'm really learning that people want experiences now. Uh, some people just have a bucket list, but I, I'm not into bucket list travel. I'm into experiential travel. So we want people to, you know, to, to, to have those hands-on experiences, learn how to cook, you know, learn how to dance, uh, you know, go into the bar, go into the pub in Ireland and play darts with the locals and, and uh, uh, you know, walk through the vineyards with the vintner in, in France and, and learn about their heritage. Um, so the experience, and then something I do as a tour organizer, and I, I, I just, actually, I just took a tour, led a tour around Italy uh, two months ago, and it was a guides mentoring tour. I was the guide and I had 25 of our young guides on the tour as tour members. And I wanted them to get the first hand experience of traveling on a Rick. They're all good tour guides, but I wanted to teach them how to do a Rick Steves tour. And one of the things that I really stress is, is recognizing anxiety and then preemptively overcoming it. As a tour guide, you know, when the whole group is uptight and anxious about something because they want to know what's it, what's going to happen or what do we do next or how does that work? And to communicate that really clearly with transparency and candid and straight, it's critical. Um, you know, it's just, you know, if you're getting on the bus, people wonder when's the next rest stop? You know, you let them know in advance so they don't wonder, is there going to be a rest stop? Uh, so there's a, if some guides are really good at um, communicating and allaying anxiety and uh, designing experiences and then helping people internalize those experiences. Something I like is what I call a reflections time, where you get together at a happy hour before a dinner and everybody has a drink and you share ideas. And the tour guides gets away from his teaching platform and just is a conduit to help people share ideas and process what they're learning. That's particularly helpful when we travel to a place that is a little bit um, challenging intellectually. But we had a reflection times in the Oslo City Hall. I would, I would invite my cousin who lives and works in Oslo to meet us. And we had a room in the City Hall there, which anybody who's been to Oslo has probably been to. And people would have a chance to sit down with a Norwegian and actually ask them, why do you people so willingly pay such high taxes? And to get a person who seems happy and seems smart to explain that, which is a very foreign concept to a lot of Americans. Uh, so it's really fun 
Thomas Jefferson said, travel makes a person wiser if less happy. You see, I, I like that idea. I don't want to go to my my grave with a with a with a uh, apron that uh, just is full of smiley faces from a lot of great barbecues. I mean, that's not a bad thing in itself, but I want to be engaged. I want to make a difference. I want to contribute. I want to have a broad perspective. Uh, I don't. I, I don't want to barricade myself with people who are just like me and think just like me. I want to celebrate the diversity on this planet, and that's what travel helps us do. And and that's just a very constructive thing these days. And that's one reason, as a, independent of a travel spirit as I might be, I'm very enthusiastic about the value of an organized travel experience when it's designed to heighten your understanding and, and give you all these vivid experiences. Vesterheim's mission is building community and creating experiences inspired by Norwegian American stories and folk art. We believe in the importance of immigrant voices and stories. From your experiences traveling around the world, what can you say we could do better to uplift immigrants in this country? You know, I was think it's interesting, Lauren, because this morning at church, our sermon had me thinking about culture wars. And I knew I was going to be talking with all of you this evening, celebrating our culture. And I know part of me wants the whole world to be like me. You know, with my Norwegian heritage, I love it so much. And I thought, what is the value of delving into my heritage and celebrating my heritage in a world that is so fraught with division when we have too much of that already in some ways? And I thought a healthy way to delve into your own heritage is to gain an appreciation of how beautiful it is. And then to remember, we are just a tiny sliver of humanity. And if you look at it as, you know, uh, as a person of faith, if you believe there's a God, you know, we're all children of God. It's just kind of like, that's that's what that means. If there is a God, we're all children of God. Um, We're all brothers and sisters, and we're all different also. And when I get enthusiastic about my goat cheese, when I get enthusiastic about putting my little Norwegian flag up, (laughs) it's because I love my heritage. But at the same time, I love every bit as much the diversity on this planet. In fact, the more I appreciate my own heritage, the more I I realize that the other 98% of humanity loves their heritage as much as I love mine and their heritage is every bit as good as mine. I mean, some people are exceptionalists, you know. There are, there are, you know, exceptionalism is this belief that, you know, God thinks we're special. Well, the only thing exceptional about us really is our ability to even think that we are special in God's eyes, because everybody is equal in God's eyes. So I think delving in and celebrating our heritage is a very, very constructive thing to do because it teaches us how beautiful heritage is. But you finish the paragraph by reminding ourselves that we as Americans are just 4% of this planet and there's 96% out there. And uh, geez, I just love going out there and getting to know it. I love coming back to my heritage more than ever, but I love to carbonate my existence by being comfortable with other people's backgrounds as well. So it's a beautiful thing. And when I go to, uh, you know, when I go to any culture, I try to tackle it just like a Norwegian would tackle, you know, the the, the Vesterheim Norwegian American Museum. Uh, I'll go to another culture's museum, which is the perfect equivalent, but it could be Turkish or it could be, you know, uh, Indonesian or it could be Japanese. And uh, I won't have the the context to understand it as as clearly as I understand my family heritage, but I will have an appreciation that it's just as valid and just as rich and just as exciting. I I guess India taught me that, you know, Loran, because people ask me, what's my favorite country? And I sometimes surprise them by saying India. Why India? Because India really, really boxed my, roughed up my ethnocentrism. It rearranged all my cultural furniture. I, I was self-assured. I knew that my way was the, you know, the, the world's a pyramid with us on top and everybody else trying to figure it out. That was my, when I was a kid, my attitude. And then I go to India and I realize, whoa, a billion people in this subcontinent see things differently than me. And that's a beautiful thing. 
I thought I knew music. There's four, four time, there's three, four time, there's six, eight time, you know, waltz time, cut time. I, I, there's major and minor and aeolian uh, in, in, in modes. But then you go to India and you realize meter and mode have nothing to do with it. It's a whole different thing. So there I was. I thought I was a good musician and I was back to the point zero in another culture. And their music, which didn't sound much to me, was every bit as sophisticated and be beautiful to them because they had a different cultural context. I love that. Some people don't like that. It's a, I, I suppose that's the fundamental difference in, in, in outlooks. But, but for me, that's really cool. Do I need to buy a sitar and give up my piano? No, <laughs> but it's an option. But I came home and I, actually I bought a sitar, but I never learned it. And I'm back to my piano. <laughs> Rick, do you have a favorite inventor or invention? Well, I read that this was a whole series about inventors and that kind of thing. I was looked around and I thought, what do I have in that regard? And I found my, this is my banana case. This, and this is a actually a, a little case that protects your, your banana when you're traveling, like this, you see. And uh, this was invented, I guess, by a Swede because I bought it in Stockholm, but it's my banana case. But I don't really think that's a very good invention. Uh, I thought about what's the best invention I found in Norway, and it's a collection of thoughts by a philosopher named Eric Daman. <laughs> and uh, older Norwegians might know this, Eric Daman, he was a political philosopher in Oslo, and he created a, a political movement in Scandinavia called the Future in Our Hands. Um, I forget the, the Norwegian title of it, but uh, it, it was actually a political force. I mean, they had members in parliament in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And the Future in Our Hands, uh, he, he also wrote a, a more demanding book called uh, Revolution in the Affluent Society. But I read these in, as a college kid uh, in my 20s, and they lit the fire in my belly for traveling in a way that broadens my perspective. And if I could credit anybody for my book, Travel as a Political Act, uh, which is, I've written a lot of books, and this is, I think, my most impactful book, um, I would thank the Norwegian philosopher, Eric Daman. I visited him um, when I was a kid in Oslo, and it was like going to kind of like a guru on top of a mountain in the Himalayas. He was such a cool guy. And I was just a, just a, a kid. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of good thinking going on as far as how we can be sustainable and how we can be compassionate and how we can live together well in Scandinavia. And I'm tired of hearing Americans um, discount that by saying, well, it's not as diverse of a society or, well, they've got North Sea oil or, well, they're less, uh, uh, they're more sparsely populated than us or whatever the excuses are. Baloney. We can learn from the Scandinavian sensibility and we can Americanize it, but we, we can certainly be inspired by it. And we can uh, try to raise our bar a little bit when it comes to organizing our society in a way that's true to our values. So there's my inventor for you. Perfect. Thank you. We'll now ask Rick to answer some of your questions. So I hope you've been typing them into the Q&A box. Um, you can continue to do that. And I have some help for the question session uh, from our annual fund gift officer, Molly Thompson. And Molly, would you start us off on a couple questions for Rick? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lauren. And thank you for Rick for being here with us. And thanks to everyone for all the great questions that you've already submitted. Um, our first question comes from Kelsey. And Kelsey wants to know, what do you think is the best age to travel to Norway with children and what cities are must visits for their first trip? Well, if you, you know, I traveled with my, my wife and I traveled with our kids every year from prenatal to 18 or 19. And it was always, um, if you can afford it, and if you don't mind compromising on what you can do as a as a as a, a a couple of adults traveling because you know you take a big hit in that regard i think it's great to be able to take the kids uh when do the kids it's good parenting in other words when do the kids get something out of it um i would say if you got little kids and people ask me where to take them i say take them to grandma and grandpa's on the way to the airport uh and then have an adult trip in europe um unless you're able and willing to take that extra expense and the hit in your experiences. But once the kids get to be 10 or 12, I think it's a powerful experience. Um, 
14. I was just 14 when my parents took me to Europe. And on day two, it occurred to me, I was a, I was a 14 year old with a bad attitude. I did not want to go. I remember thinking it was stupid. And on day two, I just thought, wow, there was, you know, different candy, different pop. I was eating pulsa wieners and drinking solo, uh, statuesque Norwegian women with hairy armpits. I mean, it was a wonderland for this little 14 year old kid. Um, I, I just thought, I'm so glad my parents wrenched me out of my comfortable little world and took me to the old country. Um, where would you go with the kids? Um, well, if you have any relatives over there, obviously uh, go there and then do stuff that the relatives do rather than going sightseeing in the big cities. I mean, the best experiences I've had have been, you know, hiking and visiting and going on boat rides and stuff, uh, doing what the family does over there. Um, but, um, you know, there's pretty predictable stuff you want to do. And uh, you just want to get a mix of country and small town and big city. But you got to spend your you got to do your cultural obligations in Oslo and Bergen and then get out into the countryside. And then our next question comes from Jack and Lonnie, who say they always have your tour book in their hands when they visit Europe. And they want to know, have you ever taken the mailboat cruise in Norway to see the Northern Lights? And what months are they visible? The Hurtegruten. I would love to do that sometime. I remember when I was uh, just a young kid, I didn't have any, Oslo was so expensive. There was a Hurtegruten boat um, permanently moored right there in front of the city hall. And it was functioning as a hotel. And they had one room that had no plumbing. They had it just uh, no toilet in it, no sink. And it was called the writer's room. Apparently, writers didn't have any money. So it was a room they had for writers. And I qualified. And I got to sleep on that boat. Uh, that was just a real, it was a real blessing from an economic point of view, because I'd say right in the center of Oslo uh, for, a, for the cost of a youth hostel. But um, I would love to go on the Hurtigruten. I've, I've never done it. I've talked to, I've known a lot of people that have done it. And uh, everybody just loves it. Uh, so, uh, but I don't know anything more about it than that. Was there another part of that question? I'm sorry. Uh, how long are the Northern Lights visible? Oh, the Northern Lights. What months? Depends on it depends on how far north you are, you know. But um, I think one one thing I've you just got to remember in the summer, it's the land of the mid midnight sun, and in the summer it stays light until really late, and it gets light really early. From a practical point of view, um, personally, I wouldn't travel all the way there, just see the midnight sun. I would just, I don't know why, why that would, why, I mean, you know what it's gonna be. It's gonna be like a, a sunset that never happens. Uh, but what I would say the practical uh, fallout of the land of the midnight sun is the sun will be glaring through your window at four in the morning. So be sure you have your shades figured out or you're gonna have an interrupted night's sleep. Uh, and then if you do go in the winter, I've traveled in Oslo in, the, in Norway in the winter, it gets dark early. Uh, you have a very short day. So when I'm doing my TV work, anything north of the Alps, I shoot in July or August. It's just, I have a rule. I don't, in the north, I always say, um, if you're flexible, remember in, in, in Europe, you want to avoid the heat and the crowds of summer south of the Alps. It gets very crowded. But north of the Alps, uh, or in Scandinavia anyways, I want good weather and I want crowds. I've never seen crowds that are a problem. Crowds, crowds are a plus. When you go out to Big Door to go to the open air folk museum, if you go in April, it's going to be just a desolate kind of depressing spot. But if you go in July or August, it's going to be bubbling with energy and all sorts of dancing and music and liveliness. So that's because it's just, there's enough people there to justify it being lively. So I want long days and I want good weather and I want lively activities. And that's why I really like traveling in the peak of peak when I'm in Scandinavia, meaning July and August. Ronald asks, what part of Norway are your ancestors from? Um, it's kind of confusing to me. I really don't know very well. Somebody just um, found me and gave me this booklet here, which is my mom's side of the family and going way, way back. And I, it was fascinating. That goes back to 1750 or something. And uh, they actually, you know, people do this. I mean, you guys, this is kind of news to me, but I could trace my different relatives there on these different lines. Um, and um, the family name is Fremerly, and the other one is Romstad, and Romsdalen, good Bromsdalen, up there by Pier Gint country, Loam, I think I was around Loam, um, but I don't know exactly. 
But today I've got, um, for a long time, I, the closest relatives of mine are in Sandefjord, two hours south of Oslo by train. I just love Sandefjord. And uh, that's where I go every time I go to Norway. And there's also a question about your last name, Steves. Is that a Norwegian name? Nope. My dad's dad was a drunken, wife-beaten, ski-jumping Norwegian, kind of a bad guy up in the mountains here in Leavenworth. And uh, he got, my grandma got rid of him and uh, changed my dad's name. <laughs> so uh, he, she married a very mild-mannered guy that has nothing to do with who I am, um, named Steves. So I should be Rick Romstead. And um, I, I'd like, I'm, I'm thankful for the Romstead that I have in me. I think I got his better part. <laughs> I like to think I got his better parts, but no, Steve's, Steve's has nothing to do with my heritage. Well, we've got a couple of questions along the theme of traveling to get out of your comfort zone. Um, so Sandra would like to know, where were you when you felt the most uncomfortable? And was there something there that helped you feel more comfortable? uncomfortable well i've never really felt the most dangerous i've ever felt was um late at night in washington dc i was walking around you know and uh also in in russia in moscow i felt sort of like anything could happen to me, nobody would know. Um, but uh, I've never really felt, and I've traveled in El Salvador and Nicaragua during during their civil war, you know, a long time ago, and that was dangerous. Uh, but, um, you know, in my work, I've never really felt uncomfortable. What I like is to be uncomfortable with my self, what, what, my self-assuredness. I like to be made uncomfortable with uh, things that I thought were right, and then I go somewhere else and I realize, oh, smart people can differ. That's the kind of, a lot of people avoid that. Uh, I, you know, when somebody says have a safe trip, I've always thought about this because when I was younger, everybody said bon voyage. Nobody said had a safe trip. That, I mean, if somebody said had a safe trip, you'd go, whoa, where'd you come from? And they said bon voyage, have a good trip. And now they say have a safe trip. And I know, because I've been thinking about this and working in this milieu for decades, I know that statistically, you're safer when you go to Europe than you are when you stay home. Statistically, because we live in a country with a lot of guns and a lot of murders. You know, I don't think it's, I don't cower at home because of that. But if you're really interested in saying safe, you'll you'll go to Europe right away. I mean, when somebody tells me have a safe trip, I say, well, or I, 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 I consider saying, well, you have a safe stay at home because where I'm going is safer than where you're staying. So to me, there's nothing dangerous about traveling. What's really dangerous is staying home and not traveling. If everybody stayed at home and didn't travel, this world would be a more dangerous place. So it's my mission in life to inspire people and equip people to, you know, as I said, I think earlier, venture beyond Orlando. Orlando is great for three or four trips, but if you've done Orlando, try Portugal, try Norway. Uh, Norway, bums a lot of people up because they are so they are so much more socially um i think mature than we are in a lot of ways uh they work together they live together they have to live together um they need each other it's a beautiful thing i love going to a country that can teach us a little bit about how to organize a society it's one thing i just really treasure about my experiences in scandinavia um, people just give a lot of thought to how to organize a society they trust their institutions. We don't trust, we've lost trust in our institutions. And when you lose trust in your institutions, then that corrodes your ability to work together as a society, I think. And then that's the beginning of trouble because then people who have power take advantage of that power and it's not for the greater good. In, in Scandinavia and in Norway, I believe it's for the greater good. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing that we can be inspired by. The greater good, imagine that, paying a little extra in your taxes for the greater good. Um, yeah. And then uh, Dana here is wondering, have you found there's a difference in the attitudes of Americans on your tours over time? And are they more or less open to being a traveler versus being a tourist? Yeah, there's two kinds of travelers. Um, there are 
people that just want to see cultural cliches on stage. And there are, and, and, you know, with a bucket list and those are, that's fine. They're just tourists. And there are travelers to me, there's tourists, travelers, and pilgrims. And um, it's kind of a, it's sort of different. It's a hierarchy. And I'm not saying you got to be all one and none of the other, but mix it up a little bit. Um, I find being just a tourist gets boring after a while. You can check off all the sites and so on and see all the cliches on stage. I really think uh, over time, I've honed my, I, I, I've designed my business. So I kind of attract people that want to be travelers more than tourists. So you kind of create your clientele by how you advertise yourself. Uh, so I get more people that are interested in getting out of their comfort zone, staying in characteristic hotels, which might be a little bit uh, not good enough for a lot of people that want American style hotels and American style comforts. Um, you know, I, I just want people to be cultural chameleons. I talked about that, I think, in my talk. And people sign up on a Rick Steves tour to be cultural chameleons. Um, uh, but I think, but that's just my clientele. I think in general, people are a lot more a lot more well-traveled these days. So they are more sophisticated in their travel these days. In the old days, it was the year rail best of Europe. If it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium whirlwind tour. That's what people took. I've noticed, I've been selling year rail passes for 40 years. The all Europe train pass doesn't sell very well anymore. The all Europe guidebook does not sell very good anymore. I used to sell a lot of both of those things. I still sell them. They still have a place. But now people travel with more focus. So a Scandinavia pass, a Britain pass, a France pass will sell more than a Europe pass. Um, and then the individual country books will sell more than the all Europe. Uh, that's probably a function of two things. People are more sophisticated uh, and they've traveled. They've been there, done that. Now they're going to go deeper into one country. And also we Americans have a, a progressively shorter and shorter vacation. We have the shortest vacations in the rich world here in the United States. Our Norwegian relatives can't believe how short of vacations we have. And uh, we don't even take our vacations. We're so focused on our work life, uh, which is kind of a nice ethic if, if that's what's really important to you. But um, my Norwegian friends and loved ones, they have a different priority and it's more family and it's more self-actualization and they've got a longer vacation. We could have a longer vacation if we wanted it, but as a society, we choose to have short vacations and work ourselves into an early grave. It's a free country, but if you travel too much, you might see it differently. You see, in a lot of ways, I'm like the medieval jester. I get to go outside of the castle and learn what they're talking about there and then come back into the protection of the castle and tell the king the truth. And the king did that in the Middle Ages. He paid the jester to go out there and come back in and annoy the king with the truth. You know, Tom, uh, um, Muhammad, I love this quote by Muhammad. He tells me, uh, he, he told people, uh, don't tell me how educated you are. Tell me how much you've traveled. You can get a formal education, but if you haven't traveled, you've got, you don't have that advantage. There's something really cool about traveling. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. I'm so thankful that my parents wanted to see the relatives in Norway. It was my gateway to the world, really. Well, I know we've got a lot of great questions and we uh, I think can go a couple minutes past 8.30. So I'll maybe let Loran um, ask one or two more from the audience, if that sounds good. Great. Uh, Rick, Amelia would like to know if there are any countries that you haven't covered that you're planning on visiting soon. Um, you know, before we, uh, Amelia, I'll, I'll answer that in a sec, but um, I want to remind people, I would have loved to talk more about Norway but I wanted to focus on what was kind of unique that I had to offer tonight. But I've got two shows on Norway that I've produced for public television. And it's an hour. One's on Oslo and then one's on the Fjord country in Bergen. And if anybody wanted to watch those, if they haven't seen them yet, it's, um, again, you just go to ricksteves.com and you can go into the TV section and just click and you can watch any of 150 different TV shows that I've got. I've got a show that's an extended version of the talk that we gave you tonight. I've got the shows on all these little samplers I teased you with. But most important for our, our topic tonight is I think I've got five shows on Scandinavia and two of them are on Norway. And I'd love it if you guys could watch those. As far as Emily's question about other countries, you know, I my favorite countries really are outside of Europe. I, I'd love to travel more outside of Europe, but I've got this platform and this mission and this niche 
and this responsibility. And if somebody gave, I've, I've never been to the South Pacific, I'd love to go there. If somebody gave me a all expenses, two week vacation to some place with the most fancy, wonderful experiences in hotels, I'd say, you know, two weeks, I really have to go back to Spain and Portugal and update those guidebooks. Uh, I just love my work in it. It's a little bit of a burden because 20 or 30,000 people would have a better experience if I spent two weeks working on those books. So why wouldn't I spend two weeks working on those books? So I've got myself in that situation. So long-winded answer to your question, most of the world I haven't seen, um, uh, but I know Europe quite well. And I will continue to focus on Europe because that's my work and that's my responsibility and my mission. And in Europe, what I'd like to do is go further east. Ukraine would be a great place to get to know. Georgia would be a great place to get to know. Um, uh, but uh, I also have to factor in where's the market. I could write a book to Georgia. I could spend a year writing a book to Georgia or Ukraine and sell hundreds of copies. Or I could write a book uh, to Paris and sell 40,000 copies, you know. So I need to kind of read the market. I got to say my beloved Scandinavia guidebook is one of my worst selling guidebooks because it's a small market, not because the guidebook's not good. It's just, you know, France, Italy, Scotland, Ireland, those are big. Iceland, Iceland sells twice as much as this book. And it's, it's just a book that I've just written in the last few years. Um, but having said that, uh, <laughs> I, I'm so committed to this book and I, I just, I lay awake at night thinking, I gotta get back and keep working on it. And it's so much fun. I just absolutely love traveling all over Scandinavia and um, I'd love to do more. Wonderful. And we have some information to share with you from our guests tonight. Uh, Walter wonders if you belong to a Norwegian big dialogue, one of the organizations of people in the United States who have ancestors from the same part of Norway. He would recommend them as a way to discover your family heritage. Ah, well, that's good to know. What, what is the, what's the organization again? What's it called? The overarching organization is called, well, maybe we should put it into the chat. It's a little bit long, but Big Delog and Asfellus Road, a Big Delog, B-Y-G-D-E-L-A-G is the generic name okay. for a group of Americans with similar ancestors from Norway or ancestors yeah. from the same part. Nice. That's good to know. Well, I sure enjoy my local uh, Sons of Norway club and uh, our pancake breakfast. Excellent. Thank you all for sending in your questions, especially to you, Rick. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'd also like the opportunity to thank our sponsors, the Thompson Family Foundation, who are sponsoring not only this lecture series, but also the exhibition at Westerheim. And to remind you that the Innovators and Inventors exhibit is on view through May 30th, 2022. The next lecture in the series is virtual and will explore the theme of teaching innovation. The date for that lecture is March 19th, and then the final lecture in the series takes place in May and explores the art of innovation. Please visit Vesterheim.org to register and for other announcements about the lectures in the series. We also encourage you to visit our website, and we will have full recordings of the past lectures and Rick's lecture tonight available. That concludes this evening's presentation. Thank you all so much for making Vesterheim a part of your evening with a special thanks to Rick Steves, my colleagues, and our sponsors, the Thompson Family Foundation, for making the event possible. Thank you all and good night. Good talk. Happy travels. <laughs>